our ability to compute on a log chart, it's a power law. Mm. And uh, it, it, similar to Bitcoin, does Bitcoin break the power law at some point? I think the answer is yes. On the compute side, do, does it happen at some point? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Because it's it's getting to probably a much deeper question of like what how the universe works and what is the universe as, as far as like consciousness and stuff. And now you're opening up a rabbit yeah. hole. Yeah, and I, I don't want to. I mean, we can go down that path, but it, it gets very esoteric real fast. But yeah. Really fast. Yeah. You mentioned power loss. I'm, yeah. I'm fascinated with this idea of diminishing returns. Uh, I, I've got a view that I think most people do bearish. Uh, I, I also believe there's a possibility in the future that all these models do get broken to the upside. Yeah. I'm not sure what it looks like. Yeah. Do you have any They definitely idea? get, I, in my opinion, they definitely get broken mm. to the upside. Uh, I Hopefully we uh, go through... I don't want it to happen either. I have two, I have two, you know, there's two arguments to it. If you just accelerate and rip the band-aid off and, and we get over to that, there's going to be a lot of pain that's endured for a short amount. This, I mean, it's the classic pull the band-aid off, right? Yeah. Are you just going to rip it off and scream for a couple seconds and then everything's better? Or are you just going to slowly excruciatingly pull the thing off and like every hair on your arm is like coming off and you're like, ah, because <laughs> people would say that going through the wish for more and more cycles, because that's all these are. These are mm. hopes and dreams and wishes that you can't control this, right? <laughs> it's going to do what it does. Yeah. Uh, but if you're hoping that there's more and more cycles, you're effectively saying, I'm just going to keep pulling the Band-Aid off and, and clown world's going to continue to yeah. accelerate and we're going to bridge the transition nice and slowly. Mm. Other people, if we go through hyper-Bitcoinization this cycle, right, you're effectively ripping that thing off and there's going to be a lot of pain for, you know, whatever that time frame would be. Is that years? Is that a decade? Is, is the pain a year or is it a decade? I don't know. I don't know. But, the, but I think that whatever Bitcoin chooses to do through human action, right, is going to be a, a some, some array of those two outcomes. And if it happens really quickly, I think we need to be prepared for some pretty painful uh, societal issues if it would happen really quick. Yeah. Um, and I think if it goes really slow, I think it's just going to be, we're just going to see the erosion of, uh, you know, many cultures because of it. Yeah. Like inflation's already picking up big time around the world. The way I, the way I view it, I think, I think the longer these cycles go on, I feel like the more pain these emerging market countries are going to see with inflation, like Argentina. The China. ones that don't pull in El Salvador. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Do you have any idea who might be, like if you're looking around the world, are there any countries that yeah. stand out? Oh, I mean, El Salvador stands out. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the challenge is uh, when you're looking at this, because of the, you know, Alex Gladstein's uh, book and just hit all the, his talking points between the world, uh, the, the world Bank and the IMF and that coordination, to just get developing nations to get more indebted and be, you know, uh, servants to the G7 with their monocrop type, uh, you know, harvesting of that of those societies, mm -hmm. and then them just becoming more and more reliant on these these ever growing, never to be repayable loads of, of fiat debt. Mm -hmm. um, that's really hard to break out of without like insanely bold leadership. Um, and, uh, I think for some, especially for the one that takes the first step and does it so boldly, I find it interesting that you have a, a country and you have a company mm -hmm. that have both demonstrated it with absolute, uh, conviction, mm -hmm. right? Like when you look at micro strategy and what they did with their treasury, Michael didn't have to like literally do the whole treasury. He could have taken the 500 million when he put this on. He could have done 10% in Bitcoin. He could have done 400 million in, in S&P 500 type things, right? And he could have let that grow and it would have, it would have been demonstrative, but it wouldn't have been uh, obvious. Like at this point it's obvious oh, yeah. and it's gonna be really obvious in you know the coming two years. You had a very similar thing happen in El Salvador, mm -hmm. right? And so 
I, what I guess I'm concerned with is, is it takes such bold and courageous leadership to take such a bold stand against institutions, the, the IMF and the World Bank and all the other ones that are NGOs that are connected to all that stuff. It's just, uh, the incentives are insane. Yeah. Uh, I, but because we had two leaders step forward and do this and they've demonstrated what this looks like, I think it might actually accelerate others to make similar bold calls, especially because they made it through the whole cycle. If he, if he would have backed out or kind of changed his position when it went down to call it 15,000 USD a, a coin and said, okay, all right, this was a mistake or, or he was left office and didn't have the time to see it through uh, uh, the next cycle. I think it might've been harder on the, on the country front, but other countries are taking note because of that bold leadership. So it's important. I yeah. agree. I think they yeah. are. And uh, it's crazy how quickly times change. I remember at yeah. the bottom when Bitcoin was at like $15,000, there yeah. were people genuinely talking about the possibility of Bitcoin going to 3K and Michael Saylor being yeah. liquidated. Yeah. I think he had to make a, he made a tweet or a statement about it, kind of like reaffirming, okay, I don't get liquidated unless it's at like $3,000. But yeah. there was serious talk about Bitcoin going there. Yeah. Was, well, and I think that that was just for, for one of the, he had one loan that he had borrowed mm -hmm. against um, his Bitcoin. And I think that that was the one that would have been liquidated. And I, it, it wouldn't have taken the company, I don't think that would have taken the company down. No. Yeah. So yeah, there was there was a lot of like horrific takes on that one when the price was down and that don't understand corporate finance, they don't understand accounting, they don't understand that the company was still making a product that was banging out 75 or 100 million a year. Yeah, it's awesome. It yeah. is awesome. Speaking of awesome, <laughs> you hosted a panel yesterday. Yeah. We have yeah. some pretty big brains, if I do say so myself. You had yeah. Michael Saylor, yeah. Lynn Oldham, yeah. and Larry Lepard. Yeah. I believe the first question you asked uh, Michael Saylor was kind of asking him, okay, how do you think <laughs> that the fiat minds have kind of evolved their thinking since 2020, yeah. since Michael began buying Bitcoin? Yeah. I might just flip the script and ask you, do you think many of these big Wall Street titans and billionaires yeah. are beginning to kind of change their tone on Bitcoin, especially since 2020, since Michael really entered the space and... Yeah. institutionalized Bitcoin to a degree. I think for them, I think that the sheer influx of buyers into these ETFs in the first, how many days in are we? 47 days or something like that yeah. is blowing their minds. Mm -hmm. And for them, they're seeing, because that's the world that they're used to is like, hey, the S&P 500, SPY or VOO or any of the, like, the major indices that they, that they all know really well and track and they know what those flows are and those volumes are. And they know that those are the king makers on Wall Street or some of those products. And now they're looking at this thing that they all thought was gonna totally flop, maybe get a billion dollars across all of them. Some of them probably were, you know, snickering as they were like, like oh, this thing's gonna tame Wall Street. And then, then it's like, no, uh, or Wall Street's gonna tame Bitcoin. And it was literally the opposite. Bitcoin's showing how how incredible it is. And so I think that sheer volume is causing them to have the cognitive dissonance situation where they're saying, hold on a second, like what in the world is this? Let me, let me do a little bit more research. And then the more they're digging in, I heard a comment yesterday uh, that BlackRock uh, was having an institutional day where they were educating people every you know wall street large institutions in the room this is like recently and they were they were providing education on bitcoin and the person said the thing that blew their mind is they were literally using the charts that all of the bitcoin maxis and the people that you know are doing at home podcasts or whatever <laughs> have been sharing on twitter you now have blackrock presenting these charts not only that, in these presentations that I think lasted eight hours that day, the well, BlackRock uh, event, yeah, um, they were having a deep conversation about how Bitcoin is not wasting energy. It's actually looking for wasted energy to use and finding efficiencies. And so that it's one of the strongest, like these are panels and like presentations that they're providing <laughs> BlackRock. Yeah. So, um, 
I think that um, I think there's a lot of people, a lot of whales. Uh, when I say whales, from an institution standpoint, that are getting, and I think we have just kicked off. Michael made the comment on that panel yesterday. It's the, the start of the Bitcoin gold rush that's probably going to last for the next 10 years happened right now this year. Um, so, yeah, uh, bring it on. Uh, unfortunately for them, most of these coins are already spoken for. And most of these coins are spoken for by people that have deep conviction and probably don't plan on putting them back onto the market for a very long time. But, uh, you know, we go down how many eight des eight digits past the the right side of the decimal point. So there's plenty to go around, just maybe not the, the amount that they would like, but the only variable is price. There's plenty of liquidity, right? And it's just gotta adjust the price to <laughs> <laughs> satisfy that demand. That's right. So yeah. buckle up. Buckle in. Yeah. yeah. So I think the fact that BlackRock is holding uh, this kind of eight hour conference about Bitcoin now, a month yeah. after the ETFs have launched, yeah. is a really big signal that potentially, I don't know what's going to happen in the short term, but maybe the flows aren't going to slow down as much as Wall Street expects. Because mm -hmm. I've been watching uh, Eric Bapunas, the uh, mm -hmm. ETF expert, so to say. Yeah. And he's been very surprised that the Bitcoin ETFs have continued to see like record yes. volumes. Yeah. Three, think, four, five weeks yeah. in. It's blowing their minds. It is. Yeah. And I think the thing too, if you talk to anybody that's, you know, that understands that really well, like Eric and, and others, James is another one that's covering it a lot. Um, they'll tell you that the, the flows that you've seen to date are mostly just retail flows mm -hmm. because a lot of it hasn't even been turned on for institutions yet. And like that's happening in the coming months. Mm -hmm. And then uh, like Michael started talking about the lending and, and the custodial ownership that they're not going to be rehypothecating it mm -hmm. and they're going to be standing up derivatives on top of it and what that's going to bring uh, to the price uh, things are going to get really spicy. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm not saying in a bad way. I'm just, I'm just saying it's, it's a network effect. It's just yet another network effect that's opening up these substantial uh, tranches of capital that, that can now kind of plug into the Bitcoin network. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of people, a lot of whales. Uh, when I say whales from an institution standpoint that are getting and I think we have just kicked off. Michael made the comment on that panel yesterday. It's the, the start of the Bitcoin gold rush that's probably going to last for the next 10 years happened right now this year. Um, so, yeah, uh, bring it on. Uh, unfortunately. And then the more they're digging in, I heard a comment yesterday uh, that BlackRock uh, was having an institutional day where they were educating people every you know wall street large institutions in the room this is like recently and they were they were providing education on bitcoin i want to be respectful of your time we've been going for nearly yeah. an hour yeah finish with a few rapid fires so <laughs> okay. i actually interviewed you remotely yeah nearly a year ago to the day so it was like okay. it was in december 2022 okay it was near the bottom oh was it okay. it was very close to the bottom yeah we were both bullish Oh, yeah. There were three big themes that stood out to me in that podcast. Okay. One was we were both watching the coins being ripped off the exchanges. Yeah. So you've enjoyed that short and sharp little highlights reel of my discussion with Preston Pish. You are going to absolutely love the full one hour interview I had with Preston. That was posted over on the Bitcoin News YouTube channel literally minutes ago. So if you haven't seen it yet, check it out at the link. I'm going to put it up on screen somewhere around there. Click on that bad boy and it's going to take you straight to that video. So with all that said, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. The next time I'm going to be talking to you, I'm going to be coming to you live from Bitcoin country, El Salvador. So stay tuned. I'll see you guys later tomorrow.